my name is Tony Peacock. I'm the uh, department head in political science and the moderator for this fourth and last facticity panel uh, ref called Truth and Truthiness. Uh, I will introduce our uh, various uh, panelists here one at a time. Uh, the format for today will be, I, I'm going to read the paragraph that we've put together to describe what this panel is about. And then I will introduce uh, our first panelist, Dr. Rodriguez here. Uh, <clears throat> and she will give a three minute presentation. And then I will do the same with each of our additional panelists. And they will give a three minute presentation. And then we will have a discussion among the panelists. And then we will all, for those of you who want to, convene at six o'clock uh, someplace around here. And uh, we can carry on whatever additional discussions. And we're obviously happy to answer any questions uh, any of you may have uh, once we're com we've completed the panel. So the authors uh, uh, <clears throat> have been kind enough to provide me a, a bio. I will read that and then we will carry on with the discussion. But before that, let me just read to you uh, the brief paragraph that we put together describing what we think we're discussing today under the auspices of truth and truthiness. The title of this panel, Truth and Truthiness, refers to a word, truthiness, that Stephen Colbert first used on the mock news show, The Colbert Report. Truthiness refers to statements that an individual believes to be true based on feelings, opinions, or perceptions, rather than on the basis of evidence, logic, or reasoned examination. Statements that seem or feel like they are true, even if they are not necessarily true. This panel will discuss the tension, if not outright conflict, between truth and truthiness in the media and in popular opinion. How do we distinguish between these concepts? Can we as a society find a consistent means of arriving at a baseline of accepted evidence-based knowledge from which good faith discussions can proceed? Is it possible, as Aristotle might have put it, to ascend from the world of mere opinion to knowledge about social, political, economic, and scientific facts or truth? If so, how do we do so? How do we encourage critical thinking, not only in the media, but in public life and in education? These are just some of the questions that this panel will address. So that's the paragraph that I think some of you may have read earlier that we uh, hope will cover most of the issues that we're going to discuss today. But uh, as these conversations go, they may discuss other issues as well. So let me introduce our first uh, panelist, Dr. Melanie Dominich Rodriguez. Uh, she's a professor of psychology here at USU. She's a licensed psychologist. Her clinical work and applied research have uh, a primary goal of making the benefits of psychology accessible to marginalized populations. She focuses in particular on the cultural adaptation of evidence-based parenting interventions for Latino families. She is also a pa passionate about training future psychologists to be culturally competent. She has published 91 articles or book chapters, has co-authored three books, and has helped develop nine intervention manuals. Her productivity is primarily the result of the joy she experiences in collaborating with her doctoral students and her colleagues. So Dr. Rodriguez, the floor and I think the microphone. Oh, you've got one, okay. Is yours. <laughs> I'm a woman empowered. <laughs> okay. Buenas noches, good evening. In 2011, the Scientific American proclaimed it's time to end the war on salt. They reported on a meta-analysis of seven studies with more than 6,000 pooled participants that did not find strong evidence for the relationship between salt intake and heart attacks, strokes, or death in people with high blood pressure. In 2017, the New York Times again sounded the alarm based on experimental research conducted on Russian cosmonauts that revealed that higher consumption of salt did not lead to higher levels of sodium in the blood, and even more surprising, that high salt intake may be implicated in weight loss. Yet our salt intake guidelines all the way up to the World Health Organization sound alarm, uh, a loud alarm about high salt intake. It appears our worldwide salt intake guidelines are based on truthiness. What's interesting about this expected truth about salt intake is that the original observations utilized empirical methods. For example, in 1904, French physicians observed that six patients with high blood pressure were salt fiends. Later, <laughs> their words. Later, animal research in the 1970s proved the link between salt intake and high blood pressure. The catch. 
the rats were given the human equivalent of 500 grams of sodium per day. Do you know how much sodium you consume a day? In 2012, the CDC reported that the average American consumed 3.5 grams of sodium per day. This is less than 1% of the amount given to the rats. The method did indeed establish a relationship, but the relationship observed was not applicable to the real world. In my line of work, I focus on the experiences of marginalized people who have been historically and systematically excluded from scientific inquiry. Indeed, science is full of verified half-truths. The truthiness is basically a body of truths that apply to one group but have not been verified for others. And the consequences of our confidence in these half-truths is not minor. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of US women, and it affects men and women differently at every level, including symptoms, risk factors, and outcomes. But only one third of cardiovascular clinical trials that include women, include women, and only a third of those that include women include reports by sex. Let's go to depression since I do mental health. Depression has the third highest global burden of disease and it is the leading cause of disease burden in women worldwide. Women experience depression at one and a half to two times the rate of men and the differences are believed to be tied to biological sex. Yet fewer than 45% of animal studies on anxiety and depression use female lab animals. One more, just so you don't fall short. Two-thirds of the 5.1 million people currently suffering from Alzheimer's disease are women. And an American woman's overall lifetime risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is almost twice that of men. Now, Alzheimer's researchers have long assumed that this is true because women live longer than men. They have just begun looking past this assumption and they're learning that hormonal changes at menopause and sex differences in gene expression may be implicated in these differences. In our engagement of empirical methods to arrive at truths, we sometimes forget that the questions that we ask matter, who asks the questions matters, who answers the questions matters, and who interprets the answers to those questions also matters. We can unwittingly assume that we have an evidence-based answer because we have used the methods of science and yet arrive at a wholly inadequate knowledge base for having ignored the need to generalize our findings across populations and contexts. The risk here is one of confidence, thinking we have the answer when we have some of the truth for some of the people. I'm just going to uh, read this from down here. <clears throat> Our second panelist, uh, Dr. Rob Davies, is an associate professor of professional practice in the physics department here at USU. He is a physicist who has been focused on critical science communication for more than a decade, specifically on the topic of climate change and human sustainability. He has given hundreds of public lectures across the state to a broad diversity of audiences, and he has also been extremely active in leveraging the arts in science communications here at USU. Dr. Davies. So, uh, two years ago, uh, the city of Miami found itself in the midst of an outbreak of the Zika virus. And to remind you, this is a mosquito-borne virus uh, with generally mild consequences for adults, but with utterly catastrophic outcomes for newborn children, namely microcephaly, which is a form of severe brain uh, malformation. So understandably, and as one would hope, the city took the situation very seriously. And so city leaders and health officials, business leaders, the media, and ordinary citizens representing different religious, political, and cultural perspectives came together to formulate a response, and their shared goal was the containment of this outbreak. On the table were a number of possible actions. Some were uncontroversial, such as aggressive public education, how to minimize your risks for contracting the virus. But others were more contentious, including aggressive mosquito abatement using powerful insecticides, and most controversial, the quarantining of entire neighborhoods. And each of these measures had their proponents and had their critics. So insecticidal measures, for example, reduce the mosquito vector but can carry health and environmental risks uh, of other kinds. And the quarantining carries with it significant hardship on businesses and individuals within the quarantine zones, including significant economic hardship. 
So fast forward uh, to the end, the response included all of these, education, mosquito abatement, quarantine measures, and the, uh, the policy, the response was successful for the shared goal. The, the, uh, outcome, the outbreak was contained. And there are two things about this episode that I think are quite relevant to our discussion today. And the first is what did happen. A diverse community came together to successfully address a critically important and somewhat complex issue. Cultural, ideological, religious, and political differences did not prevent recognition and resolution of a serious problem. This was a genuine good faith exercise in reality-based risk management. It's a model of how things should work. The second thing I want to mention about this episode is what did not happen. So the success was in large part because it was notably not infused with the alternate fact, post-truth viewpoints that we find pervasive in so, many of our, so much of our public discourse today. So nobody showed up to the meeting with the position that, you know, Zika isn't a thing, that there's no such thing as the Zika virus. No one suggested it wasn't transmitted by mosquitoes, and no one suggested that spraying wouldn't uh, reduce the mosquito transmission or that the effects of the disease weren't bad. Nobody argued that. Or if these suggestions were made, they were marginalized and pushed out of the discussion very early, as evidenced by the result. And no television stations or talk radio hosts pushed narratives that didn't conform to conventional criteria for evidence. So there was no conspiracy theories, no fake experts, no disinformation, and no truthiness. As a result, policy was crafted by starting from a foundation of shared, accepted knowledge, and so what I'm most interested in uh, at this point in our discussion, is certainly not the only part of our discussion, but I'm interested in how we find our way as a society to a place where all public policy begins from a foundation of shared accepted knowledge. And we know that this is not the case today. And truthiness plays a real role in why that's not the case. And that's both good news and bad news. The good news, the bad news, of course, is that truthiness, uh, non-evidence-based uh, discussion, finds its way into critically important issues. But the good news is that it seems that at least some level truthiness is necessary. In other words, it provides a veneer of evidence. And at least in some discussions, uh, we feel if we're not going to adhere to the truth, we need, at least need to have the, uh, a veneer of it, the appearance of adhering to the truth. Thank you, Dr. Davies. Next up, Dr. Norm Jones. I'm going to wear my glasses. <laughs> Dr. Norm Jones joined the history department at USU in 1978. He chaired the department for 18 years and has been USU's director of general education and curricular integration. An Idahoan, he received his BA from Idaho State University, an MA from the University of Colorado Boulder, and a PhD in history at Cambridge University. He has taught numerous courses on Western civilization, medieval and early modern Europe, and the history of Christianity. He is an internationally known historian of Elizabethan England and has published 11 scholarly books and more than 50 scholarly articles. He has also held fellowships at Oxford University, Cambridge University, Harvard University, and the Huntington Library. Dr. Jones, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I think that we have to recognize that truthiness and truth are very closely related. They often share common roots, but they can lead us to very different places. So let me tell you a story that might illustrate this. On a dark November night in 1568, Agnes Bowker gave birth to a cat. <laughs> there were eight witnesses, the midwife and seven neighbors. They, seeing the monster cat emerge, they began to run, but the midwife invoked the Holy Trinity and called them back. <laughs> News of the monster were spread, and Lord Keeper Bacon of England ordered an investigation at the highest level. It, the birth had deep political implications, and the government had to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> Why? <clears throat> because everyone knew that deformed births were a sign from God. In the 1560s, with England torn between Catholics and Protestants and civil war over religion, a very real possibility, the cat, if born, was proof that God was unhappy with Protestants. If it was, it was a trick and not a real birth, it was a Catholic attempt to create fake news. <laughs> Therefore, all the best science was brought to bear on the cat. And knowing it was possible for the cat to have been born, they measured, dissected, sketched, and interviewed witnesses. The cat was found to have bacon in its stomach. 
They grilled Agnes about her sex life, too. They did a full tutor CSI on the case. Everyone knew, given the science of the day, that it was possible for Satan to take the form of animals and procreate with women. Bowker admitted Congress with Satan, too, but the investigators didn't believe her. They concluded it was a form of witchcraft cooked up by the village schoolmaster to seduce her. <laughs> as far as we know, nothing happened to her after all this. There was no, there was no trial or anything. They just said, well, you, you're, you're apparently misled and let her go. But here we have truthiness. Everyone knew it was possible, so the birth of the cat was plausible. And so the investigators had to take it very seriously. Uh, by the way, it was caught up in the media. The, the, the printing presses were running hot. They were selling this broadsheets with this pictures of the cat on it all the time. And so this is part of the reason they've got to control the media and it's fake news. But at any rate, um, they agreed on one single absolute. Whether or not you believe the cat was born, they knew one thing, that God created and rules the world and is at war with Satan. But they had different authority structures for their interpretation of the birth. Those who wanted to believe the world was out of balance thought the cat was the devil's spawn and a divine warning. Those who did not believe the world was out of balance, meaning those in power, uh, used the best investigative methods to give authority to their denial of the cat's birth. As far as modern science is concerned, we suspect the cat birth was to cover a case of infanticide. But that's only because we have a very different model of truth, which denies the role of God and Satan in cat births. <laughs> the moral of this strange tale is that things that seem truthy are alternative explanations plausible within the society that constructs them. Just plausible. As, as Rob is saying, you have to have at least the, the, the veneer of science to prove that it is plausible. Uh, and that, that occurs in the, in the discussions of the cat birth. So in any public discussion of what we should do about anything, we often insert what, assert what seems to be truth as we understand it, based on the absolute truth as we understand it, on, on our construction of reality. In the cat case, we have different ideas about how God acts. Uh, does God act through revealed truth and providential interference, as opposed to empir the empirical truth of a universe ordered by God's natural law? knowable by investigation. As creators and consumers of information, our models of absolute truth affect what it is possible to believe and to do in any situation. Often this means finding the common ground in the welter of competing truths. They could all agree that the cat had been born. It was the meaning of the cat's birth that was the problem. So if truth is in this way socially constructed, we have to respect the truths of others and recognize for ourselves the basis of what we accept is true. And that's where we start the conversation. We start with the fact that the cat is born, and then we have to understand the truth as we understand it, and how others don't always agree. But that cat is still sitting there waiting for us to explain it. That's the truth we cannot avoid, the cat. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jones. Next up, Dr. Kim Hickson is the department head of journalism and communication. He has a varied background in the jobs he has held, all of which are perceived quite differently in how they deal with truth. For example, his PhD is in journalism, a discipline where facts are assembled, verified through sources, and then reported as the truth. Dr. Hickson has also been a politician in Wisconsin, having been a member of the state legislature there. Dr. Hickson has thus been a member of two professions that many people believe are habitually and chronically, quote, loose with the truth. <laughs> Dr. Hickson has also worked professionally in advertising and has taught numerous courses on the media in his lengthy career. In his scholarly work into the use of the media, he has touched on the perception of, perceptions of truth and credibility of the media. Dr. Hickson. Thank you. While we uh, search for some universal truth, the truth that might or might not exist, we need to recognize and be aware of the sources of the truth that we accept and use. Our group here has the aim of establishing a base of knowledge, a base we can all agree on to start good faith conversations in efforts to find the truth. I think that truth is fluid, that it is ever-changing and flexible. This truth is the truth that we accept, 
the truth we are willing to deal with, it is a practical truth, a convenient truth. One of the most respected journalists of the 20th century is Walter Cronkite. He was the anchor of the CBS Evening News for 19 years. Close to 30 million Americans tuned in five nights a week to watch and listen to Walter Cronkite. He ended each newscast every night by saying, and that's the way it is. And that's the way it is. What power that statement has. He didn't say, that's the way I feel. He didn't say, that's the news. He said, that's the way it is. An opinion poll done back in the 1960s found that Cronkite was the most trusted man in America. The PR people at CBS publicized this statement and for the rest of his career, if not his life, Cronkite was known as the most trusted man in America. During the Vietnam War, Cronkite visited the battlefields to do a special program about the war. At the end of this special program, when he said, in his opinion, that the U.S. could not win the war in Vietnam, many people believed him. President Lyndon Johnson watched the program and he said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America. A few weeks later, in a big surprise, a big shock, Johnson announced that he was not going to run for re-election that year. With Cronkite's opinion, events were set in a different direction than perhaps they would have followed. Opposition to the war increased. Robert Kennedy decided to run and then he was assassinated. Richard Nixon wins the election. The Vietnam War lasts another five years. We have the Watergate scandal and Nixon resigns, the only president to have ever done so, so far anyway. <laughs> Cronkite had given an opinion that many people took as truth because he was, after all, the most trusted man in America. When we, as a society, try to establish a base of knowledge, when we look for a greater truth, the universal truth, the real deal, in the past we have trusted science, religion, philosophy, even education, even government, and sometimes even the media as sources that we base that truth on. In this search for the truth, we should all act like journalists. We must consider the source or the authority. Is that source reliable? Is it accurate? Is it credible? Is there a bias inherent in that source? Has this source been truthful in the past? Has this source been disproved? Can we trust this source? And if this source is not entirely accurate, then do we discredit it as a means of getting to the truth? And oh, by the way, the poll that uh, found that Cronkite was the most trusted man in America was not a scientific poll. It was not what we academics would call reliable research. So to end, I ask you the question, do you think that that makes Cronkite's opinion about the Vietnam War truth or truthiness? History suggests that it was the truth, although it was just his opinion. Thank you. All right, well thanks to all, the, uh, all of the panelists for their uh, uh, brief uh, presentations.
Uh, let's begin. I, I think this question touches on uh, what all of you have said. Uh, uh, let's start with this idea of truth per se, or universal truth. How is truth constructed? Is it socially constructed, politically constructed? Uh, is there a, a universal form of truth or reason, as some of the, in the, the political philosophers have referred to it, that we can appeal to? The Declaration of Independence appeals to the opinions of mankind and suggests that there's a universal standard that is cross-cultural, cross-national, that we can all appeal to. Uh, and there are concepts of justice that we would think have to apply universally. Any society that treated women as subordinate to men or did not treat uh, people on the basis of their race or ethnicity equal to other people, uh, or in criminal law did not have a presumption of innocence or due process, we would look on all of those societies as deficient from the point of view of justice. And it's not just a function of context or society, it's a function of what we think is right as opposed to wrong. So my first question is, is that a place where we can start? Is there, are there principles of reason or knowledge where we can begin our conversation on social and political issues? Only as long as we all accept it. We all have to accept it before there can be a place that we begin. And we have to accept it as being the reality. Yeah, I would add to that that, that truth is socially constructed and that it's socially constructed by people in power. So they construct and they shape, much like Walter Cronkite, um, that, that truth. And so is there a universal truth? I suppose we are, we're born and we die and we must eat, sleep and... <laughs> <laughs> Evacuate. <laughs> Didn't occur that I needed a synonym for that word. Um, so, but I think the universal truths are very, very few and very basic. And then from there we construct. Well, and they're not universally all the time accepted in the same way. I mean, Tony, your, your examples may all be true in a platonic sense of true, but our socially constructed ways of getting at what is true at any given moment are varied. And so if we look at, look at our cat, essentially we, we are having a discussion about Aristotelian methodology uh, and how you apply it. You, know, you all know the scene in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, how do you know she's a witch? <laughs> well, she looks like a witch. Well, that's a platonic explanation. Uh, of course, we know she's a witch because actually we do an experiment on her and we weigh her and her body mass indicates that she is a witch and therefore we burn her. Uh, now, there, there's a moment where everybody agrees that she's a witch, but their reasoning is they come at it from a very different place. So it's possible to have absolute truth, but we socially construct the way we get at absolute truth. And most of your examples are, uh, as we historians would say, really presentist in that most of society wouldn't have agreed with any of the things that you laid out as desirable as forms of justice. I mean, for thousands of years we've been discriminating against all these people, the people in power have, and it hadn't bothered anybody very much. You know, I don't, uh, Melanie in particular, when, um, when you say there are very few sort of um, absolute truths, I actually, uh, you know, I, I certainly want to acknowledge the notion that there are aspects of what we often call truth and, and what Tony threw out there is these notions of justice, you know, um, is it true that all people, we should treat all people as equal? Is it true that we should, there should be these notions of fairness and, and justice? And I would say, particularly based from the previous panel discussions, you know, we, the notion arose that I don't think that's what people were talking about. I think, and certainly wasn't what I was talking about with the Zika. I was saying that the, they follow these sort of established criteria for get of evidence. And so before you even start with, okay, we're going to move toward, toward, forward to a solution. In my case, it was the, you know, okay, let's, so let's contain the outbreak of Zika. Um, and we should apply notions of, of uh, justice and fairness and all of those things, I, I think those are all things we probably in the room agree, can agree on, but that's not even what I'm talking about. I think that's been there for a long time and what we've sort of, what's changed very recently is that we can no longer find a found, common foundation of facts, of knowledge based on um, 
uh, again, these sort of established criteria for evidence. And so this very few, you know, we had this discussion earlier, very few absolute truths. If I march Kim up to the roof and toss him off, we know he's going to fall. Uh, whether he believes it, whether anyone else believes it, that's a different level than do I think that we should all uh, apply dress as fairness. And I think it, before you can even get to the conversation about moving forward to a solution and applying these other socially constructed truths, you've got to have a foundation of what I would say are not socially constructed truths, just evidence-based truths. And if you can't do that, it's, that's the necessary condition. It's not sufficient. There we go. It's not. But, um, but that's the necessary place that I think we have to start, and that we're not, we've, we've begun uh, more and more. We, we can't even find uh, that foundation to start from, much less starting to agree on notions of fairness. Go ahead, Norm. Well, I, I think uh, uh, what worries me is that your assumptions that we've ever been able to construct truth that is commonly accepted, uh, including the pushing off of the roof, because we, as we agreed in our discussions earlier, we don't know what's going to happen when we push him off the roof because he might bounce. So there, the, 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 there's a, a very <laughs> limited range of, of these kind of foundational physical realities, which I think is what you're talking about. This is the empirical observation is that, yes, we fall if we jump off the roof. Beyond that, the meaning of jumping off roofs gets socially constructed. <laughs> well, but I'm, I'm just going to push back a little bit on that and, and say that um, uh, what do I want to say? Um, boy, it just flew right out of my head. Well, right, the notion of getting back to a place. I, I don't think I said that. I think I said I want to get to a place where, uh, and I, but I, I would say in my experience, I certainly feel like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, in my life, even 40 years ago, uh, we were more in a place where you could agree on a base level of knowledge. Uh, and this notion of uh, um, disinformation, misinformation, while certainly it was around, has taken a very different level now. And now there's a structure in our society, there are forces at play that really amplify those things. And so we're having a much harder time coming to a place of, of common foundation of knowledge. And what, how, regardless of how effective we've been at it in the past, we're clearly absolutely ineffective at it right now. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in figuring out how do we get to a place where we can at least agree climate change is happening. There's data on gun violence. There's data on health care that should be taken into account. And if it isn't the full truth, like Melanie came out and said, you know, said if we're having a conversation about health outcomes uh, and cardiac uh, treatment for health, heart disease, someone can point out that, hey, that, doesn't, that data doesn't really cover this particular group. And in your case, Melanie, you were talking about women. We can at least still agree that you know, that's a fair point. And we still have a process to go look at that. We don't simply say, no, that's not even a thing. You know, that's not even a, and that's kind of what we do now on lots of things. I want to get back to this idea about me falling off the roof. <laughs> uh, you, you, were, not, you were pushed. Not, when, not when, when we discussed this uh, the first time, uh, th there was nothing about me bouncing, okay? <laughs> But anyway, um, to, to get back to that uh, whole idea, if we're looking at some sort of truth as being really universal, and if we're trying to find that, that real truth, then I have to say that not everywhere will I actually fall. If we're out in space, for example, and you shove me out of... Uh, out of the space station, I'm not going to fall. Actually, you will. <clears throat> well, unless we're geosynchronous. <laughs> but, but yes, but the, the fact of the matter is that, that I think that we, we fall back onto what we're trying to find as, as a base, and a lot of times that's science. And it may not always be the right choice that we have. It might not always be. I accept it. I think Rob accepts it. I think we all probably accept science in that way. But whenever we come to any sort of 
problem, any, any great question like, is there a universal truth? I think we have to be open to all possible answers. I, I guess I'm not, I, I'm kind of trying to, at least in my mind, I'm, I'm not trying to look for some all-encompassing universal truth, just some things that we can agree on that, again, follow this criteria for, uh, sort of a, an established criteria for evidence. And um, I, so I mean, I, I guess, my, let me put it this way, there's, there's, I think the three of you feel a bit more than I do that truth is fluid. And I think maybe we're just talking at cross purposes. I'm talking more about, you know, observation, evidence-based knowledge. Um, but so going back to my Zika example, I'm curious. So if, if somebody, if, if, if we're on the council and somebody shows up and says, you know, Zika is not a thing, um, something I would call sort of a, someone who's either ignorant or uh, disingenuous. But um, either way, I aren't going to have input based on that particular position that's going to take us to our goal. So my question is, should we exclude them from the conversation then? Should, should you have to sort of qualify for a conversation on these sorts of things by accepting a base level of knowledge on whatever topic you're talking about? Well, I think one of the questions is whether or not your base level is the only possible base level, as Kim was saying. Now, if somebody came to that conversation and said, Florida has Zika because Florida is full of sinners, and God is sending a message through this disease, and so the answer is repentance, we would be in an interesting position in that many, many people believe that that is a valid conversation if you want to take it to the level of absolute truth that you know absolutes the suggestion of an absolute sort of suggests that there is something out there that made up the rules right so <laughs> the way that that thing is acting you know it's you, it doesn't solve the problem of zika but it is a valid statement about it uh, and a presumed absolute and so you the conversation then has got to go around what do we do about it that's why i keep saying there's still a cat what do we have what do we do about it it's not the ultimate truth is the question. It's the action we need to take. But well, sorry, let, let me just press you on that, Norm. Okay, so what is socially constructed or non-absolute about the proposition that all individuals should be treated equally under law? Well, that assumes that there is something out there that creates rights, that, that creates absolutes. And if we agree that there is something, and we write it down in a very revered piece of paper, uh, when we act on that agreement, but as you know yourself, I mean, the history of the Supreme Court proves that, that that's an absolute that is not necessarily understood the same way at any given moment in time. And so there's always, an agreement on an absolute doesn't mean anything about how you actually find the absolute in action. Okay, but can you have a conversation unless you agree on the, uh, on the idea that you can receive, you can get to a resolution? Because if you're already admitting in advance it's just a product of your opinion or your context or how you interpret it, then there's no point in having a conversation, is there? Because you already know in advance there's no truth and there's no resolution to the issue. Well, I think you have to have the conversation because we're a civil society. We are working together. We can say that our goal is this. We recognize the goal, but we may have very different explanations of why there is a problem and what might be done about the problem. But that's, it's in the discussion of your truth and my truth that we can find some sort of resolution to try and move towards the goal, which is one of the reasons we never quite get there, because some of us are always trying to move in the other direction. Uh, it's, it's a process. And I think this is what Rob is asking for, is can we accept a process that we can say, if we use this process, we will come to a, a good point? There's an interesting issue of scalability here, which we hadn't discussed before, and that makes bringing it up more exciting, which I think you can, you, I think all of us could agree on the truths that are very precisely observed. When a person is cut, they bleed. You can line up 500 people and you can cut them and it'll take a different amount of pressure and a whatever, but you will get everybody to bleed. We can agree on that. Where do we fit that bit of truth and what context with what purpose requires some glue? Why is that cut in the purview of medicine as opposed to a health profession that includes homeopaths? 
we keep those things separate. So then we start organizing the truths that we can agree on and we start organizing them in different ways. And there's an interesting thing that happens on the other end. You know, yes, all, we can agree on the big values. So we have these little truths and then we start putting them in these social constructions. And on the other end, we can come up with these big values and we can agree on them until we start coming up with operational definitions for those values in which the operational definitions butt up against the things that we know and we've organized in some way. Um, and, and I think this is where the, the truthiness piece uh, bites us in the butt. So yes, all people are created equal, but what constitutes a person? And what constitutes equal? And as you move across different societies and different people, that gets defined in different ways. Um, so I, I, I'm thinking back to your question, and I think we have an issue of scalability, that the truths that we can probably agree on are not large enough to structure uh, society. I mean, okay, so if we, if, if the answer then is that you can't exclude someone from the conversation because they've demonstrated a, a gross level of ignorance on the topic at hand, um, and I'm not talking about, again, uh, the next level up, what I would consider of, okay, we're going to accept constraints that we put on ourselves moving forward like fairness or justice or things like that. I'm talking about the base level of temperatures going up, mm -hmm. Zika's a virus. If we can't exclude those voices from the conversation, and I'm not entirely sure we shouldn't, but I, I take I take the I take the problem because it's it's certainly not doesn't fit with the, our notion of democracy and being an inclusive society. So I I take the problem, uh, I take that point. But if you can't, then I'm going to bring us back to sort of the here and now in our society, where we are making no progress on issues of critical importance. We're certainly no, what I would say, consistent progress. Um, with major steps back on, on critical issues, um, kind of bringing the discussion to that for a second, <laughs> what's the next step if you can't exclude voices that really don't adhere to established criteria for evidence, and then therefore short circuit the entire conversation? I mean, if it's just a few, then they get marginalized pretty quick, sort of culturally. Everybody just lets them have their say and then ignores it. Um, but that's not where we are right now. We're not even getting to the conversations of, uh, on a number of things of, okay, um, how should culture come into this? How should uh, equality come into this? We're not even getting to that. We're, we're debating basic established knowledge before we can even get to those conversations. And I want to know how to get past that. But who's to say who is too ignorant that they should be excluded from any conversation. So if we're building a quick example, <clears throat> if we're building a mountain road and we say, well, we want to make it safe, and there's lots of ways to make it safe. We can, maybe someone might say uh, speed limits, speed bumps, uh, a rail on the a guardrail, something like that. Uh, we all understand the parameters of what we're trying to do. Keep people from driving off the road. If somebody is part of our committee, is part of our council uh, that says, you know, gravity is not a thing. We don't know if somebody drives off that road, if they're going to go into the ravine. Um, that's the level of uh, rejection of knowledge that I'm talking about. We wouldn't, I, I think we would exclude them from our further discussions on what do we do about making this road safe. And I think we would rightfully do that. And um, uh, I can think of many examples on a national and international scale for which I feel like that should start to happen at some point, but of course that has to be the cultural norm to do that. And the reason we're not doing it is because there are now substantial numbers of people who don't adhere. But what if, to these, what if one of those people has, let's say, very little knowledge of, I mean, we all know what gravity is, but can explain it in some sort of scientific way? What if this person can't, can't do that? If this person has no knowledge of engineering about how much you have to bank a road to make it safe. But yet this person does have knowledge about braking in cars and about what types of tires do best in what sort of conditions. And perhaps the people who have been driving down this road at a high rate of speed who are having accidents, perhaps it's because 
they don't have good brakes. They don't have the right tires. And this one person has this knowledge. It's a different knowledge. So you bring in, you bring in one, one aspect that I think is important that I certainly left out. And that is something we've all said already, which is the need for good faith conversation. So if, if that's really the case, if someone is just genuinely unknowledgeable but educable, that's different. Um, they ask questions, I say, well, so we've got this evidence here, you know, et cetera. And then they bring with them their whole wealth of, of experience and knowledge to the conversation. That's one thing. But the additional part that I didn't throw in is that this person is uneducable. You can put all kinds of evidence in front of them, um, all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, what we would call base levels of knowledge and try to help them understand, but they're not interested in that. And so that takes us to a different level, but it's also one, and I'm not trying to be, um, I'm not trying to be uh, hypothetical here. These are, this is a real situation we find ourselves in as a nation on all kinds of problems, is bad faith interaction. But I was in politics, and I saw lots of people as uneducable, okay? <laughs> I saw lots and lots of them. But, Am I the person who really is going to say to those people, you know, you, you can't be educated here, so let's not have a conversation. Because they may have some other way, some other way of coming to that problem that does make some sense. Well, and there's a piece here. Um, as an educator, one of the ways that I check myself um, when I'm frustrated in a, in a pedagogical interaction is to, you know, if a student is not understanding something, I will always ask myself, am I teaching it the right word, way for this person in this moment? Um, and so I think there's a piece of collective responsibility in this exchange of determining whether somebody is uneducable, how, what makes them so, and, and what are the people that are coming to the table bringing in terms of their openness to the possibilities and to the discussion and the shared responsibility for finding that common ground, um, I, I think it goes beyond the expert and their expert role who determines the parameters of the discussion. Yeah, I, I think we, we have to remember these are discussions that happen over a period of time. So if you take a snapshot, you might say, well, that was the stupidest thing I ever heard. It doesn't mean that that person isn't going to change their opinion or might be educated. I mean, we're sitting here in a room full of people who are paying a lot of money to get a thing called an education. And I suspect most of you who have had an education or are getting an education have discovered that you don't always still assume the same things are true that you assumed when you were six. You know? So we have to have some faith, and this is, this is the system, this is the process, some faith that people do learn through these interactions. We've all sat in a classroom or a seminar and learned something from someone else who has changed the way in which we perceive reality. But what we get often is the, is the sound bite. We don't look at the trajectory. So as someone who's been living a trajectory for a dozen years on climate change, um, I would I would say I absolutely understand what you're saying, and I've seen that a lot. You know, sometimes you say, don't even engage, it's not worth it. But you never know what someone takes away from an interaction. The brow furrows and they go off, you know, and, and the next thing you know, a few months later, you get an email that says, that completely surprises you. Nevertheless, I think we can all identify, without having to think too hard, issues again in our nation uh, for which that is not happening. And these aren't issues for which we have infinite time to respond. And so uh, I certainly take the point that um, it's more complex than the, the simplistic way that I laid it out. Uh, and it, but So if we're not to exclude these voices, how can we at least, I, I guess I'm interested in process at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what's the, uh, we need to do something different than we're doing right now. Um, and uh, certainly that's, I guess that's my, my hypothesis. We're not making progress, or at least enough progress, on very critical issues. And it's because of bad faith interactions that go on and on and on. And so it, um, how does one get around that then, if, if we can't exclude people from the conversation? All right, well, uh, <laughs> bad faith, good faith. I want to focus on faith for uh, the next question. Uh, here, uh, we've talked a lot at these panels uh, about scientific truth, evidence-based truth, 
I want to ask, you know, what's, is there a place for religious truth as well? All right, the Constitution, the First Amendment in particular, uh, contemplates that we all have the uh, free exercise of religion. We can live according to our conscience. Uh, and obviously, uh, many Americans, perhaps most Americans do. Uh, and the Constitution seems to give a role to reason and to revelation. So I guess my question, uh, focused in the context of our panel here, is what is the relationship between scientific truth and religious truth and our question about truth and truthiness? Is there a place for religious truth in the conversation? If so, where is that place? I'm just going to object to the, object to the use of the term truth. Um, as the other panels sort of have dis discussed, the notion of uh, truth or knowledge uh, has been uh, evidence-based. And, uh, and uh, the last panel went into great distinction on, between the notion of that and belief, uh, which was a very different thing. So I, I think here I'm, I, I actually, uh, it's just a, for me it's just a different conversation. So I'm there is no such thing as religious truth. There's religious belief. Uh, in, the, in the way that we've talked about it uh, throughout these four conversations. Well, as a historian of religion, I, of course, have to take some exception to that. <laughs> because I, we are talking about a, a couple of things. One is a capital T, truth. This is when you, you say, is there such a thing as a universal moral truth? This is capital T, and this, this immediately in Western civilization is going to evoke the existence of God. And a whole lot of religious thinkers have said that's where science starts. You can't, without the, the system that God creates, you cannot think about science. Modern science as practiced in the West is the product of Aristotelian modern science. It was run through Thomas Aquinas, and we eventually in the 17th century saw it got off the equation and put in calculus instead. But, the, but I think most people, if, they, if you say what is right, what should we do? There is a reference to some thing which is not just belief, They're, because they can't probably explain exactly what they believe, but they do assume that there is some larger construct that we usually call religious truth. Why is that not belief? Well, because belief uh, is an actual active statement about this is, is true as opposed to I feel. And the I feel in most religion, it's about feeling. It's not about explaining what you believe. I suspect if I took all the religious people in the room and gave them a test, they would probably all flunk their own religion in the, the sense of being able to say, this is what I believe. I believe that they're you know, three in one or whatever. But that's different than saying, I know there is something out there that is bigger than I am that has ordered the universe. So when we, the problem is we, in the Constitution, have said, and they're all created equal. We, we refuse to say, and there is some absolute truth, eternal truth, deity, that is more true than anybody else's. We said, you can all have your own, and we're not going to tell you which one, which, of course, immediately set you into this, this great kind of denominational uh, war about what is va valuable, what is true. And that comes back to that higher kind of metaphysical question. Because there are many of the questions that we have in our society are created by science but answered by religious values. And, you know, when does life start? Well, once again, though, it sounds to me like you're, you're at the next level up from what I'm thinking of where our base problem is right now. You're at the level up of, okay, how do we move forward not with what I would, not at all what I would call truth, but what we all accept as uh, parameters around how we're going to behave and choose and move forward with, say, policies or something like that. We're going to, some of those parameters are equality or justice or fairness or tolerance for uh, other cultural beliefs, whether they're religious um, or simply traditional. Uh, and I agree that discussion is important. But that's yet another level up from the base. Our, <laughs> you, you simply can't move forward on so many problems that we have without establishing a base level of knowledge. What do we know about it? People are getting sick and the kids are being deformed. What do we know about it? We know it's a virus. We know it's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, we, know that these, we know that these following things will be effective. 
um, based on evidence, not based on religious belief, not based on any well, of that. We, we believe that we know that. And we're, we're trusting but some authority who's told us that. We have evidence for that. You're right, and the, and the trust is important, right? Because this is part of the problem, is we have huge numbers of scientists that tell us that the planet is warming, but there are significant numbers of people, certainly in this country, who don't trust that. And I'm not saying that they don't have uh, reasons in their, uh, in their histories for not trusting it. And Melanie, you've mentioned some of this before. I mean, just the notion that science isn't trusted in all communities mm -hmm. for good reason. I mean, I'm wondering if you would remind me what your, that discussion was. Well, I mean, I think in the, the knowledge base of science is built on a focus in, on particular groups. And there's, there's a book that I assigned one year to my ethics class and never again because students reported actually feeling traumatized by the content. It's called Medical Apartheid. Um, and it documents the history of people of color um, and medical discoveries and medical care and how they were, in essence, abused and science was built on um, knowledge that, for example, blacks did not feel pain and so surgical procedures were performed without any anesthesia and discoveries were made in the process um, that were important and our current knowledge base is built on without acknowledging the, the horrors. And so you could go to a doctor and you could be sliced and diced because supposedly they know that that's the right thing and it's not. Their knowledge base was not accurate. So these are communities that feel like they've been abused and treated unfairly, uh, even tortured at the hands of science. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so logically you're not going to trust that institution like someone else who doesn't have those feelings would. Mm -hmm. and, and that I can understand. So that, but that's a different, uh, and, and that I think is certainly an important aspect of this lack of trust in knowledge. <laughs> can I invoke Heisenberg? <laughs> Are, are you certain? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if the uncertainty principle is, is something along the lines by observing it, you change it. Yeah. It is all process. Any, any conversation about human belief and human action, what, what is true or not true, is in, the, the truth is in the process. So the, if, this, this has come to me as maybe a way to distinguish, distill my... Um, frustration at this point, or a little bit, which is that in that, in the, again, the Zika uh, example, you had people of different political persuasion, different culture, different religion, coming together, and even though they have different religious beliefs, different political ideologies, different senses of what fairness is, they were able to agree on a common base of what I'll call knowledge, based on uh, conventional norms of evidence, and regardless of any of those differences that they had, that's the foundation that they were able to agree on, but that for many, many issues, certainly on a national level, our society is not able to, even though they had all those other differences. You know, it, it, it seems okay, this, that... Kim, you get the last point, so it's gotta be a good one. Oh my God. Here. <laughs> it's gotta right. be the most profound thing we've heard all night. Well, it, 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 it seems that what we're working toward is trying to agree to a destination and we've somehow gotten kind of away from this agreeing on a base of knowledge. The, the destination we want to reach with Zika is we want Zika to be cured. We want it to not exist. All right, so how do we get through that? Do, do we get to that through science? Do we get to it through praying, for example? I mean, we just don't know. And your, 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 your um, example of, of the mountain road, uh, if we all come to the table, we just don't want anybody to have a crash and get injured or, or killed. I think we can all agree that's our destination. But how we get to that destination, and so to me, uh, as far as our group is concerned, I think we failed. <laughs> because we haven't reached that base of knowledge, but uh, that's I think, a very uplifting place to end. I think <laughs> this is, you know, but 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 this is how we get there. This is how we get there, and so you know, maybe it's it's beyond us right now, and we're going to talk about it more later. So perhaps so we can only go up enlightenment. Hill.
Okay, well, th thanks to all of the panelists for a very fine discussion. Please join me in thanking them all. And as I believe you all know, there will be a half hour reception to follow. We're happy to answer any questions uh, you might have. And uh, uh, thank you very much to everybody here that came out. Uh, for the last of the facticity panels, we appreciate it. So thanks to all of you.